are you? My name is Dean Collingwood. I'm one of the volunteers here. Uh, you just entered the hide room, which is the, ba uh, the bedroom that I stay in when I do my tours. Uh, the story is that one of the, orig one of the early keepers, Henry Hyde, uh, passed away in this room. Uh, in October of 2017, I was here for my two-week tour, and after during the first or second night here, I was sound asleep. And most married couples will understand this. You know, your wife will nudge you at night or move into you. Well, I was here by myself, and it felt like someone kicked me and was leaning into me, and that woke me up. And I felt it distinctly. I pushed it away like it was my wife. And then when I got up, then I moved my foot again and pushed it back and there was nothing there. And when I woke up, of course, there was nothing in the room, but it definitely was the feeling that there was somebody in my bed. And two days later, two evenings later, the bed shook and woke me up. Shook for what I, I, I felt it for five seconds, but it was enough to wake me up. So, from now on, what I was told now, every night and every morning, you say good night to Henry, and you say good morning to Henry, and that supposedly keeps everything safe and secure. <laughs> this tour, I've been here a week, and so far, so good. Hi there, we're Pat and Ron Anderson. So, so one of the special things about this light is some of the historical characters whose presence we still feel. Um, on our first tour here at Big South Point. Uh, we were up in the kitchen um, doing our orientation actually and the director uh, asked us to all come downstairs into the, um, to the apartment downstairs for, for something that we were doing. And we all traipsed downstairs and when we came back up we smelled gas. So we looked and um, the knob on the, the uh, stove, we just turned a tiny bit, we straightened it out, opened the window, aired things out, and thought that was really strange. Um, ten minutes later, we went somewhere else in the house for something, and when we came back again, we smelled gas. Um, so we put some tape on the knob that kept um, turning and decided that we needed to report there was a problem with this stove, which, oh, by the way, has since been replaced. Um, the next morning, uh, Robert, the, uh, the gentleman who probably has more of his heart and soul in the restoration of this uh, complex than, than anyone else on the planet, um, uh, passed away a few years ago, uh, was, came out and we were telling him about the problem with the stove and then somewhere in the course of our conversation we joked about it being Henry or no, about being Hank, because we were calling the ghost Hank at that time. And Robert said, well, that's your problem. His name is Henry. Don't call him anything but Henry. So after that, we referred to him as Henry, and the stove never came on again. So you tell me. Um, another experience that we think um, was really kind of weird, there was uh, a large group of us volunteering that year, so one couple was downstairs in the apartment and uh, we came up from work on Monday and Ron threw his, uh, well tell the story, you threw your jacket? Well, I threw my jacket on the bed and uh, went about our business for the day and then I came back and, and in the evening and I grabbed my jacket and there was a rosary underneath there and uh, I didn't have a rosary to put me in, didn't know where it came from. So he brought the rosary out to the group and held it up and said, does anyone know where this rosary came from? Well, the gal that was staying downstairs said, no, but I had a rosary on the top of my dresser when I came in yesterday. So, but that's not it. That's not the rosary that I had. So um, we didn't know what was happening with the rosaries, but we did know that, or, or had been led to believe that that Henry had been a Catholic. I too, we too are Catholics, and so I thought, well, maybe Henry needs someone to say a rosary for him. I said the rosary for him, uh, put it, the rosary away, and that was the last of the movie in rosaries. So, 
Henry is a friendly ghost. All of our ghosts here we think are pretty friendly. Um, that's not to, to frighten anyone away from being volunteer keepers, but it's part of what makes this place very special to us. I am Larry Stoltz. I am one of the volunteer lighthouse keepers here at Big Sobble Point. Um, I've been asked to explain one of the, if you want to call it a haunting, uh, during October of 2017, uh, I was in bed about 4 a.m. in the morning and I was awakened by a sensation that I can best describe as imagine a pigeon rubbing up against your face and then taking flight. Uh, there was a, a general rubbing up against uh, the right side of my face uh, followed by a, a, a cool breeze and then the fluttering of like wings going off into the distance and that's what woke me up and when I sat up in bed uh, it was silent, uh, dark and uh, I kind of attributed that to an experience and not a dream. Uh, I am standing in the Blake room and this is where I had my personal experience where I described a fluttering and a pigeon-like sensation, sensation up against the right side of my face but this room, the Blake room, is uh, the most haunted room in the lighthouse. This is where most of the experiences occur. Larry and I were here working by ourselves, uh, and between 2 and 3 o'clock, we I was leaving on Monday, and uh, so I figured I'll go downstairs and I'll start washing my clothes. And I went into the basement up and down several times. I also went upstairs several times. At the end of the day, after we closed the lighthouse, Larry and I about 5.30 went upstairs to get a drink and to put some heavier coats on because we had to go out and clean the toilets, the porta potties. Well, we walked upstairs and the door that normally is between the uh, north side living room and the kitchen was closed and it's always open. So I asked Larry and he said, well, I didn't do it. I said, okay, I didn't really pay much attention to that. Walk into the kitchen and the door that leads to a uh, set of stairs that leads to the basement is always closed because it is a sharp set of it's a dangerous leaving it open. And it was wide open. And I knew from the, I'd been up there an hour before that it was closed. So we were paying attention now. We got our drinks, used the restroom, and then went downstairs to get the materials to clean the porta potties. And that leads to a hallway that leads to the basement. And that was the door I was coming up when I uh, was doing my laundry. And every time, I, I same reason, I made sure it was closed because you had short steps there. Uh, that door was wide open. Now I know for a fact that I had closed it and Larry hadn't been there. So we both walked over and I looked at this door. If it isn't closed correctly, the frame is kind of bent or, or twisted and that door opens on its own automatically. So I closed it shook it and Larry closed it and shook it or held it and shook it so we knew it was closed and locked and we walked got our material walked outside it took us 15 minutes to clean the porta potty and we walked back in and, and that door was wide open so something opened that door and we assumed it was Henry the friendly ghost <laughs> <laughs> Here at Big Sable Lighthouse, every lighthouse has a ghost story to it, and uh, this is uh, Henry Varnum's uh, uniform here, and Henry was a keeper uh, from the mid-50s to, to the mid-60s here at uh, Big Sable Lighthouse, and we've had a lot of people tell us that uh, that stay out here, volunteer keepers, that they've experienced Henry in different some different ways, so uh, Henry loved a good cigar, and so you know, they uh, smell cigar smoke or uh, baking bread in the oven, uh, even when nobody's upstairs baking bread, and especially the light here in this in this case. Henry likes to the keepers to know that he's here, so they shut the light off at night. And uh, you know, about the middle of the night, uh, once in a while, Henry turns that light on so that uh, people know that he's here. July 2003, the group of keepers were leaving to go out to dinner. The last couple was about to leave. Iris thought her husband had left to get the car when she heard a noise in the hall. She called his name, and there was no response. So she opened the door leading downstairs to the side door. As she opened it, she saw a shadowy figure pass by her right side. Thinking it was her husband, she said his name, again with no response. Just then, she looked down the stairs to see her husband outside pulling the car up to the lighthouse. 
August 2001. A keeper reported all the lights on in her bedroom in the middle of the night and seen a man in a red and white striped shirt walk across the room. When she asked the other male keeper the next day why he was in their room, he insisted he hadn't been and that he didn't even own a red and white striped shirt. November 2002. Nancy was spending the night alone in her downstairs apartment. When she went to bed around 11 p.m., she heard noises upstairs directly above her bedroom. She went upstairs to check it out and found nothing. Just to be on the safe side, she locked the door that leads from the stairway to the upstairs kitchen before returning downstairs. When she got back into bed, she heard the same noises. They sounded like someone was walking around upstairs. So she went back up the stairs, but when she got to the door, it was unlocked, and she was sure she had just locked it. She quickly opened it, took a quick look into the kitchen and east living room, and once again saw nothing. So she again closed and locked the door, double checking to make sure it was locked this time. Upon returning to bed, she heard the upstairs walking noise again. Now she was really getting scared. She went upstairs again to discover the door unlocked for the second time. She did not open it this time, just quickly locked it and ran downstairs, locking the downstairs apartment door as well. It was too late and dark to escape to her car, which was parked by the porta johns, very far away. Plus the thought of going through those gates on the long isolated road was terrifying. So she called a girlfriend and chatted for quite a while. It was after midnight before she returned to bed and thankfully there were no more noises. June and July, 2003. The keepers reported smelling cigar smoke during the night several times and none of them smoked. And there is no smoking allowed in the lighthouse. All 2003 season, the new mannequin exhibit light, Henry, would be on in the morning, and the keepers were sure they had turned it off when closing up the day before. This occurred off and on all season. Other lights would be on that keepers insisted they had turned off as well. This happened mostly in the basement and gift shop. July 2003. During the night, a keeper got up to use the bathroom. When he went into the bathroom, he discovered the fairly full roll of toilet paper had been completely unrolled and was on the floor. Thinking this was a trick by his fellow keepers, he questioned them the following day. However, they all insisted they had not done it. August 2003, a book levitated in the gift shop. A guest set the book down on the counter. It lifted up and moved several inches and set itself down again. Two keepers at the cash register and the guest all saw the book move. When they see it in the same place again, it would move for a second time. August 2003. During a storm, the attic covers in the east bedroom and in the small living room were pulsating and moving and spinning. October 2003. Three keepers were sitting in the kitchen at the table. The door that leads to the downstairs opened. They immediately looked downstairs. There was no one there. So the keeper closed the door, making sure it was securely shut. When she sat down at the kitchen table, the door once again opened. No one was there. November 2003, two keepers were staying in the upstairs east unit. It was late evening and the wife was in the east bedroom reading. Her husband was reading in the east living room when he heard noises coming from the kitchen. He knew no one was in there, but the noises continued so he got up and looked into the kitchen. He saw nothing in the kitchen. When he sat down in the living room and began to read again, he heard the noises from the kitchen once again. He looked into the kitchen again and saw nothing. November 2003. One morning, a keeper walked into the downstairs apartment where no one had stayed for several days. Immediately upon opening the door, 
she smelled a very strong odor of fresh bread baking in the oven. She walked into the kitchen where the scent of baking bread was even stronger. She saw nothing out of the ordinary in the kitchen. She left and returned about an hour later and the smell was gone. November 2003, a keeper staying in the upstairs east unit heard a door close and someone walking around upstairs around 5 a.m. No one else was staying upstairs besides her husband and herself at the time. November 2003, when seated at the upper kitchen table, a keeper and her husband heard a scratching, sliding noise coming from the closet in the east living room. He looked into the closet and saw nothing. July 2004, a keeper reported smelling the strong scent of pipe smoke in the lighthouse. This occurred twice in one day. July 2004, a keeper staying in the southwest room closed his door, shutting it securely, but not locking it, when he went to sleep at night. When he awoke the next morning, his door was wide open. This same thing happened several times to a keeper couple staying in the south bedroom during the same time period. July 13th, 2004, Nancy opened the Coast Guard door for crowd control. That night, she realized she never put the Coast Guard door key back in the cash drawer. She checked her pant pocket, and it wasn't there. She had been wearing an apron at the time, but since it was late and the apron was in the gift shop, she decided to check the apron the next morning and hopefully find the key. Before going to bed, she locked the door that leads to the stair hallway, as she did every night. The next morning, she awoke rolled over and there on the nightstand was the key. She asked Bob if he found it and put it there and he replied that he had not. She went and checked the door to the hallway and it was unlocked. She asked Bob if he had unlocked the door and he replied that he hadn't. July 2004, Nancy was sitting at the round table in the downstairs apartment. The door to the hallway was open she heard someone whisper her name twice. Thinking it was Bob calling from the basement, she called out, what, after each time, with no response. She then got up and went downstairs to see if Bob had called her name. He hadn't. So she went upstairs to ask the keeper if they had called her name. They insisted they had not. August 2004. A visitor to the lighthouse asked if the lighthouse was haunted because he said that he could feel the energy when he entered the gift shop. He stated he's had a lot of experiences with spirits. Nancy took him on a tour of the keeper's quarters and when stepping into the south bedroom, he hesitated, slowly moving his arm up from his sides. He said that he could feel a strong presence in that room hair on his arms was standing straight up. He felt a similar presence and reaction in the stairway, leading from the kitchen down to the side door. All the time, off and on, the basement lights go on by themselves. The keepers, or Nancy or Bob, turn off the lights upon retiring in the evening. Early the next morning, the lights sometimes are on and no one has been down there yet. This sometimes happens to Henry's light and the gift shop lights as well. September 2004, the keepers, Nancy and Bob, were outside watching the sunset. When the lighthouse light came on, so did the tower lights. No one was inside the lighthouse to turn them on. September 2004, upon rising in the morning, a keeper took out a loaf of bread put it on the table, took out two pieces of bread, which he put in the toaster, leaving the open loaf on the table, about four inches from the side of the table, which had a chair. He was then looking out the window with the binoculars when he heard something fall to the ground behind him. When he turned around, he discovered the loaf of bread on the floor, on the other side of the chair, with some of the bread spilled out onto the floor.
April 2005. A volunteer was sleeping in the Northwest room. Before going to sleep, he thought how nice it would be if there were a light right above or next to the bed. It could be easily turned on and off without getting out of bed. He awoke in the middle of the night and felt a tingling sensation on his legs. He looked up and there was a chain hanging over his bed. It hadn't been there before. He reached up and grabbed it and it was very sticky. His hand stuck to it. He had to use the other hand to free it. Thinking it was all just too strange, he rolled over and went back to sleep. When he awoke the next morning, nothing was there. May 2005. No one was in the video room. One keeper was at the top of the tower and three were in the gift shop. Suddenly, the lighthouse videotape started playing. No one had been in there for a very long time. September 2005. A keeper sleeping in the southwest room heard a knocking and noises outside of her closed bedroom door in the middle of the night. Since she was a newbie and this was her first night in the lighthouse, she figured that the other keepers were trying to scare her. Sort of a newbie initiation. So she got up and opened her bedroom door and no one was there. When she got into bed, she had the strong feeling two young children laughing and playing, pillow fight, and jumping on her bed. That same night in September 2005, in the south room, a keeper either dreamt that a young boy was in her bedroom very early in the morning. He was very upset and crying because a man, his father, was spanking him. October 2005, two keepers were sleeping in the south room. During the night, the lamp on the nightstand crashed to the floor on the woman's side of the bed, awakening her. She didn't remember bumping it at all while she was sleeping. October 2005. All the keepers were downstairs for the round table meeting. Before going down, the coffee pot was turned off. When they went back upstairs after the meeting, the empty coffee pot was turned on and making funny noises. October 2005. The light in the hall next to Henry was turned on after the keepers came inside from their beach fire. It was turned off before they went outside. November 2005. There was a thunder and lightning storm, and during the middle of the night, a young teenage girl climbed in bed with a couple in the south bedroom. She asked Sandy to move over, and when Sandy asked why, she said that she was scared from the storm and didn't want to be alone. August 22nd, 2005. Our story goes like this. It was our first year as volunteer keepers. We were so excited trying to learn all that there was to know about being a good lighthouse keeper. Monday, August 22nd was our first full day. It was great. We had a nice crowd of visitors that day with good sales in the gift shop and many presentations and tours given. After we closed down the gift shop, we shared our dinner meal with our fellow keepers and cleaned up the kitchen mess. After the chores were done, Ralph and I decided to walk the beach. It was a nice late summer evening and we could tell that it was going to be a beautiful star-filled night. Before turning in for the evening, our gang, Wayne, Leabel, Jan, Ginny, Ralph and myself, decided to go to the top of the tower and check out the lovely star-filled sky it was gorgeous, just as we expected, except someone left a big old light on, which cut down on our star searching. Anyway, we all came down. I, being the youngest, lagged behind to turn out the downstairs landing light before going upstairs. The hallway was dark when we said our good night to all. Around 2 a.m., I needed to use the little girl's room. As I quietly opened our bedroom door, I noticed that the light was on downstairs. The light I shut off. After using the bathroom, I ran down to shut it off again and then went back to our south bedroom. When I crawled under the covers, Ralph asked what took me so long. I told him about the light being on and that I went down to shut it off and we went back to sleep. However, within a half hour or so, while we were sleeping, our smoke alarm went off. Beep, beep, beep. Oh my gosh, 
I sat straight up, and Ralph did too. My heart was racing. It did it again. Beep, beep, beep. The beep sounded almost like the smoke alarm was being tested, not like a true alarm. I wanted to rush right out of the room, but my calm Ralph held me back and said, wait, I don't hear any other ones going off. However, we did detect a smell of pipe smoke. Ralph continued, maybe the battery in this alarm was going bad or something like that. Let's just wait a few minutes before getting everyone upset. So we did. The minutes ticked away. We talked and nothing more happened. We heard no other sounds in the house and the smell of pipe smoke soon disappeared and eventually we went back to sleep. It turned out to be a very pleasant sleep because morning came and we were well rested. After getting dressed for the day, I couldn't wait to ask the others at the breakfast table if they heard our alarm go off. No, was their answer. You see, this is what we figured happened. It was getting close to football season, and during the day, our conversations turned toward college football. We just happened to be from Ohio, and naturally, we are big Ohio State Buckeye fans. We all had to laugh and decided that Henry just had to check out those Buckeye fans that evening. Since Henry was a pipe smoker, he apparently got his pipe a little too close to that ceiling smoke alarm and it went off. It probably scared him as much as it scared us. It is now 2011 and we just finished our seventh tour as lighthouse keepers. Henry has never bothered us again. We must have passed inspection. That's our true Henry the Ghost story and we are sticking to it. Past keepers and modern day residents have experienced hearing footsteps accompanied by the sound of a cane steadily climbing in the stairs. Sailors have reported seeing a figure in the lantern room. Sarah, the captain's wife, has also been known to help help out with the dusting, whereas instead with, with her husband, Cat Captain Robinson, sitting in one of the recessed windows. Karen McDonald, the past director and curator of the, the White Rear Light Station, is quoted as saying, saying that no, don't like to say the place is haunted because because the word haunted brings into mind dark and frightening things. I like to say that it is spirited. This is spirit spirit place.